Good evening, everyone. My name is Charles Richard. I'm the Joseph P. Montiel Endowed Professor in English here at UL Lafayette. And it's my distinct honor to welcome you all to this presentation, sponsored by the George Rodrigue Lectureship and the Flora Plonsky Levy Endowment for the Humanities. Tonight, uh, Governor Kathleen Blanco will share with us her remembrances of Senator Edgar Mouton, legislator, humanitarian, philanthropist, and orator. But before she shares these memories, I would like to read some remarks uh, that were offered by our host, uh, Dr. Maurice Ducanet, uh, about two other persons who are here with us tonight. He writes, accompanying every great man is a grand lady, Mrs. Edgar Mouton. To her friends and neighbors, her marriage of 64 years with the senator is no numerical abstraction. Her love and devotion were always with the senator in the many callings of his life as lawyer, legislator, philanthropist. That love and devotion abounded, especially for her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. She was and is the keystone of the arch of the house of Edgar Mouton and his family. But only a few know of her stewardship to the community. Often her neighbors saw her loading her car with packages, never really knowing why. And they were not package, they, they were not just packages. Rather, they were treats and gifts for the children at the old Lafayette Charity Hospital on Brook Street. And not just for Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas, but good deeds done quietly throughout the year, as were her concerns and her kind acts for those in the desperate plights of illness and poverty. And how often did she fill the food bank at Albertsons, furtively hiding from her left hand what her right hand was doing, as the biblical verse reads? I know, writes Dr. Ducanet, because I spied on her when she did her grocery shopping. <laughs> Mr. Ed Mrs. Edgar Mouton, Patricia Mouton, we honor you tonight as a woman of all seasons with these tokens of this night of remembrance of Edgar Mouton, Veronica Rodrigue uh, Redmond and Joan Steer. And accompanying every great lady is a grand gentleman. Raymond Blanco accompanies his wife, Governor Blanco, in devotion to his family, to their family, and stewardship to the community. Uh, Governor, or, excuse me, um, Mr. Raymond Blanco could not be here this evening. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read the remarks that were written uh, for him by Dr. Ducanet, nevertheless. Um, in his ascendancy from coach to dean of students to vice president, he never isolated himself in administrative authority. His office was always open to the faculty and students. He listened and heard their difficulties and responded with sympathy and fairness and resolved what seemed irresolvable. His insistence that civil rights must be realized among students as well as in all offices and high positions in the university is not only part of this institution's history but also for human recording in the history of the state. He too uh, was, and he is, a man of all seasons, a man in the, in the language of his Hispanic ancestors, un grande. Uh, let's see. And so now I present to you Mr. Randy Haney, who will introduce our esteemed speaker this evening. Thank you, uh, thank you Dean. Oh, and I'm sorry. Oh, we got another present. Let's go ahead and do it. Yes. My apologies. Oh, no, no problem. This is for your dad, who we hoped would be here tonight, and we wish him well. And he's very upset he's not here, but he's. I'll handle that. Raymond had a slight st uh, stumble, yes. and he's okay. Uh, but he's uh, being checked over to make sure everything's working. So that means we have more food if there's food to be served. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen and honored guests, uh, it's my pleasure tonight uh, to introduce a, a lady that all of us know dearly. Uh, this young lady was born in 1942. I'm not going to tell you the exact age. Late, <laughs> late in December of 42. Uh, and that's the truth in a little community called Coto, Louisiana, uh, and was raised in New Iberia, Louisiana, which as we sit here tonight is less than 30 miles away. Uh, she was the oldest of six siblings, 
uh, with the loving parents of Lewis and Lucille uh, Babineau. Uh, Kathleen then went on to this university and graduated in 1984 uh, and uh, got a degree in business education. Uh, what was really cute when I learned this story is that she met this strapping young man, <laughs> okay, and got married in 84. And of course, that's Raymond S. Blanco. Uh, Raymond and Kathleen have raised six wonderful children. And Sonny Mouton used to always laugh at me during the campaign because I've introduced Coach um, as having six children. He says, Randy, if, if, if Kathleen's ever here, you have to introduce her as having seven children because Raymond's one of them, <laughs> and, and it was true. Uh, but upon graduation, Kathleen worked uh, as a teacher for two years in Broadbridge, Louisiana, and made a decision to go home uh, and raise the family. Uh, and of course, like I said, they had six children of their own. And uh, after two years of teaching, stayed home for 15 years, raised the family, raised Raymond, uh, <laughs> and made a decision to enter political life. And in 1984, Kathleen was elected as the first female uh, from Lafayette Parish to the Louisiana House of Representatives. Uh, five years later, she made a decision to run for a higher office, uh, the Louisiana uh, Public Service Commission. She was successful, won that election, and yes, the first female ever elected from Louisiana to the Louisiana Public Service Commission. Uh, a short six years later, she set her sights higher to run statewide for lieutenant governor. Uh, she was successful in 1995, was elected <coughs> lieutenant governor, and then ran for a second term and was elected with 80% of the vote of the people. Uh, and then the highest pinnacle that you could reach in Louisiana politics, uh, in most people's minds, uh, in 2003, <coughs> Kathleen ran for governor, was elected, and on January 14th, of 2005 was uh, sworn in as Louisiana's 54th governor of this state. Uh, once again, the only female elected governor then or since. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the podium, uh, truly a daughter of Acadiana and especially this university, Governor Kathleen Babineau. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Randy, for that introduction. That it was very special, and I appreciate it. I'm really honored to be your guest lecturer tonight for the George Rodrigue Foundation Speaker Series, and I want to say a special thanks to the Roderick family, another family that I've been very close to over the years for their sponsorship here tonight. But tonight, we are going to explore the life of Edgar G. Mouton, Jr., as his name usually was displayed across formal uh, literature and, and uh, his letterhead. And, but you know, some called him Senator, some called him Timut, and, but I think those who knew him best either called him Edgar or Sonny. I believe Sonny was his favorite name. Edgar Mouton is the subject of tonight's lecture because he was a powerful leader with a fighting spirit who added lasting value to Lafayette and to Louisiana. So the university is honoring him in many ways. This is just one of those ways because he added tremendous value to this campus as well. His 16 years in the state legislature were quite productive. That's, that doesn't seem to be a really long time, although now I think term limits would, would cause people not to be able to serve much longer. But after his 16 years, he served another five years in high-level state appointments where he continued to help Lafayette. When he took office 53 years ago in 1964, which is the year Raymond and I got married, um, he knew that he wanted his service to count. To prepare for this lecture about a man that I knew personally, I spoke and had the great pleasure of speaking to his family members, to his old friends, to legislative colleagues who watched 
sen the senator in action. And I read newspaper articles that were amazing. They had so many compliments talking about and praising his talents, particularly his effectiveness at, the, at legislative business as well as his oratorical skills. He was a famous um, speaker. He, he could, you'll hear a story or two. His contemporaries chose him as the best legislator three years in a row, and his campaign platform depicted thoughtful ideas of governance. So tonight, we're going to examine Senator Edgar Mouton's life through those various lenses. It's important to understand how he was able to accomplish things in what was then and still is a rough competitive environment. Politics is filled with dangerous landmines. Any of us who are in, involved in it, and Randy knows, is, um, it's filled with those dangerous landmines, so it's not a place for the timid of heart. Now, I have to tell you that mouton means lamb in French, but Sonny was anything but a timid lamb. He had a tremendous amount of courage. So I'm going to cover a quick synopsis of his career and then dig a bit more deeply into some aspects of his life, including his successes and his disappointments. At five foot, five and a half inches, which is about right there, Sonny had to look up to speak to, to speak to <coughs> most of the men with whom he worked. But no one ever accused Sonny Mouton of having a little man complex. He was self-assured, and he was never intimidated by taller people. Rather than ignore the obvious, Sonny used his height for the subject of many of his jokes. I think his favorite one was he always used to declare, he'd, he'd say, I wasn't always so short. When I married Patsy, I felt six feet tall. <laughs> his lovely Patsy. He was a fun, loving storyteller, and he made friends very easy, easily. One story was how he got his name. He said, my maternal grandmother took one look at me and said, that's Sonny. Well, then he adds, you know, I was sick as a child, so they took Saint Louis Gonzague as my patron saint. Then he says, my name is Edgar Louis Joseph Gonzague Mouton Jr. And then he'd laugh, because he, he loved laughing. He'd say, plus, since I was born in September, they wanted to call me Septon. He <laughs> said, I'm so glad it wound up sunny. I can't speak French. <laughs> but Sonny grew up and he lived his entire life here in Lafayette, just a few blocks from the UL campus. Now, when he was a child, Cathedral School's yearbook had a picture of this precious 10-year-old fourth grader, Edgar Mouton, and under his picture that was set aside from the rest of the class, it said, class leader. He won the American Legion Oratorical Contest for Lafayette Parish, and he was valedictorian of his 1947 class at Cathedral High School. He walked away with every senior class honor but two. Then he went to Tulane, where he earned his undergraduate and law degrees. He was a deeply devoted Catholic and often attended daily mass. And Raymond, uh, Randy can tell you, even during his campaigns, he would short circuit and, and run into that church, even if it was just for a little while. He married Patsy Dolphin, his one and only childhood sweetheart. During their 64 years of marriage, they had four daughters, Cheryl, Patty, Kathy, and Mary, who are all here tonight. Sonny opened a successful law practice in downtown Lafayette, and he later included his friend and partner, Harmon Roy. The Mouton daughters produced 16 grandchildren and 29 great-grandchildren. So, of course, their big, loving family was a source of, is a source of immense pride, both for Sonny and for Patsy. So, Sonny did make friends easily, and he enjoyed a lot of good success in his law practice. But a history of family involvement lured him into politics. In 1989, he was out of office by then. He was reflecting on his career, and he told the advertiser, he said, well, my father was in government, I was raised in government, and I knew all the big alligators when I was 10 years old. <laughs> he said, so I just had a natural interest in government. And that set the stage. 
1963, in a well-executed campaign, he defeated an incumbent and led the ballot to win his first seat in the Louisiana House of Representatives. State Representative Mouton was sworn into his first office in 1964, along with Governor John McKithen. He immediately befriended the governor, and he proved to be an effective floor leader, just instantly. Sonny, uh, during his second year, Senator Garland Bonin, who represented St. Martin, Iberia, and Lafayette parishes, was appointed Commissioner of Public Welfare. The governor said, Sonny, I'd be happy to appoint you to that open Senate seat. And Sonny said, no, I don't want an appointment. I want to run for it. He ran for it. He was easily elected. And that's what began his Senate career. He handily won that election. And then he had 14, year, 14 years um, of service in the Louisiana Senate. When he was there, he gained superior mastery of the legislative process. Some people spend their entire career and don't ever master the process. I promise you, I've seen them. <laughs> he was named the top floor leader for both governors John McKithen and Edwin Edwards. Sonny, in his last term, his colleagues elected him Senate pro tem. In 1979, Sonny Mutar ran for governor and he lost that election to Congressman Dave Treen. In an historic turn of events, Governor Dave Treen, a Republican, appointed Edgar Mouton, his opponent, and a Democrat to boot as his executive counsel. Four years later, in 1983, Sonny ran his last race, attempting to regain his Senate seat. He lost to Senator ba Alan Baez, from La the man from Lafayette, who had been elected to that seat the year Sonny ran for governor. And Sonny was deeply disappointed because he loved government, government and being in the fray. Governor Edward Edwards, now in his third term after defeating Dave Treen, called Sonny back into service to work as his special counsel. Edgar Mouton's gifted mind and his work ethic was valued by three vastly different governors during his 21 years in government. So those are the highlights of Senator Edgar G. Mouton's life. So tonight I'd like to take you a little bit behind the scenes to talk about his many contributions and explore how his courage, his personality, and his intellect endeared him to so many people. Sonny had a keen mind and he was fearless. His self-deprecating humor and his fun-loving spirit left people laughing because he was also a prankster. Now, he found kindred spirits in the Louisiana State Senate where his credentials were established as that effective legislator. He also found members who really enjoyed kidding around as much as he did. Judge John Saunders, a former state senator, declared he is so thankful that he came into the Senate at just the perfect time. That was in 1976, and Judge Saunders says, Sonny was the heart and soul of the Senate. He was the glue, and he could have been president if he had chosen to run. Something he deeply appreciated about Sonny's effort to make other members effective was the Acadiana Caucus, he says, at the time was the strongest in the state because Sonny Mouton helped the members get their projects approved. Sonny could help himself and anybody else who asked him. Judge Saunders loved the interaction between the Acadiana members. Armand Brinkhouse, he says, was madlessly fearless, and he was Sonny's torpedo guy. Now listen to this. Sonny would walk up to Armand and sick him like a Doberman or a German <laughs> shepherd and say, Brinkhouse, go get the squirrels in the press. Well, Armand didn't miss a beat. He would grab a newspaper march to the microphone, pick some random story. It didn't have to have relevance. And he would start ranting about it, just amusing the members. And Senator Ned Doucet would lead the cheering section, egging Armin on. This was a game that they all loved to play, and they played it well. The same people you see sit together in one room for days on end during this legislative session they passionately argue the pros and cons of multiple issues. Nerves fray easily. People take these things seriously. 
So everyone appreciates a humorous break from the routine. It's just something that, that it may seem silly, it may seem trivial, but it is so good to have. And Edgar Mouton's timing was always just so perfect. He could sense when the body needed to shift gears a little bit and have a little levity. Judge Saunders and Judge Oswald the Queer, another former senator, each recounted the same remarkable Mouton story to me. Senator Mouton launched an impassioned attack on a bill that Edwin Edwards had asked him to kill. He was unmercifully decimating every aspect of the bill. Well, Governor Edwards was sitting on the Senate floor, in the Senate chamber, I should say, watching the debate while the supporters of that bill that he was trying to kill were sitting around him. During Sonny's tirade, then Senator DeQueer saw the governor signal Shorty Boatman. Shorty was the Senate's head sergeant at arms from Abbeville. He handed Shorty a note asking him to deliver it to Sonny. Shorty, in a very carefully cultivated, inconspicuous manner, approached the podium. And remember, Sonny is in the middle of this debate decimating. So Shorty slips the note onto the podium. And then he gradually fades into the background. Sonny never paused in his verbal attack. But he slowly picked up the note. He glanced at it, slipped it into his pocket. And without missing a beat, he said, now that I have told you what's wrong with the bill, I will now tell you, on the other hand, what's right about it. Well, I mean, everybody on the floor had the same reaction you just did. It caused a rise in the Senate. But everybody present was totally amazed, as well as amused, as Sonny refuted all of his prior arguments. He praised the attributes of the bill, and he urged passage. <laughs> Governor Edwards had signaled his new position to his floor leader just in time for Senator Mouton to breathe life back into the very bill that that same Sen Sen Senator Edgar Mouton had nearly pummeled to death. And that really happened, ladies and gentlemen. I saw Governor Edwards recently, and I told him I was doing this, and I asked him for a comment, and he said, Sena Senator Edgar Mouton was one of the best political figures I ever met. Indeed, he was. <laughs> you know, he, he was really amazing. Sonny was elected to the Senate three times, and with each new term, his stature grew. I mean, and, and his, the respect for him just grew exponentially. He became a source for advice and guidance on complicated issues. And as his third term began, he was elected Senate uh, president pro tem, which is vice president of the Senate. He took his responsibilities seriously while maintaining his joie de vivre that everybody loved. Sylvia Duke was the executive assistant to the president of the Senate. She remembers how Senate comforted and, comforted and supported the workforce that kept the tense legislative process together. Got all these staff people who work long, long, hard hours. In turn, because Sonny was so good to them, they were his eyes and ears and kept him apprised of any legislative mystery that might be afloat. Sylvia described Sonny as the master mediator. If two or more members had conflicting bills, which happens regularly, and on any particular topic, he would call them in to work out as much compromise possible. So by the time they got to, to floor debate, he had effectively diffused most of the animosity between the two senators. The members could then present their opposing views respectful of each other and of the other senators. Sonny was a tireless worker. It was an extra effort which, uh, that he gave which helped the state senate maintain higher levels of decorum than disagreeing parties might otherwise have displayed. Sonny Mouton worked closely with other members of Lafayette's legislative delegation, but he was generally recognized as the lead negotiator on most area projects. The leadership positions that he aggressively sought gave him an edge when it came to competing for limited state capital outlay dollars, especially for expensive 
projects, for large, expensive projects for UL and for Lafayette. Sonny Mouton, listen to this, was able to get funding at the time for a new hospital. Now, it is now known as University Medical Center. It replaced the old charity hospital on St. Mary. He got money for a Lafayette's Vocational Technical College, which has transformed into the Acadiana Community and Technical College. Academic buildings like Angel, Wharton, Doucet, Griffin, and Fletcher Halls came to fruition during his term with his help. The second and third floors of Dupre Library were built during his tenure. The football stadium, a very expensive proposal, at Cajun Field, followed by early investments in UL's athletic complex, exists today because of Sonny Mouton. And as Governor Dave Treen's executive council, he negotiated a creative funding mix for the expensive Cajun Dome which is Lafayette's multi-use basketball arena. These investments and many miles of road improvements are assets Lafayette now takes for granted as a natural part of our landscape. Think about, that's part of Lafayette, isn't it? But construction projects are only a part of his legacy. Senator Mouton was chairman of the Senate Education Committee. He fought for teacher and faculty pay raises and he had a deep affinity for Acadiana's culture. The Acadian Museum of, uh, over at ERAF named him as a living legend in 2002. And his successor, Senator Alan Barres of Lafayette, reminded everyone that Senator Mouton was the principal author of legislation which created the Council for the Development of French in Louisiana, known as Codefil. He always did his best to provide funds and support to Codefil in its early formative years. Now, Codefil is charged with teaching French, the ancestral language of Acadiana that uniquely defined our parents and grandparents. Sonny, who spoke no French, would have loved being bilingual himself. So he made it possible for children of Louisiana to reclaim their heritage, heritage through mastery of the French language. Codefil's lasting presence today led to the thriving French immersion education that thousands of students across Louisiana now have access to. Possibly the, sen the senator's, in my opinion, single most important accomplishment was to be a part of designing a system that provided criteria for funding higher education. <coughs> um, he, he wanted objective performance indicators once he learned and understood the effect of political decisions being made on how much each campus was going to get across the state. And I want to say that I think his awareness for that need came about because of student activism on the UL campus. Governor John McKithen had proposed a budget reflecting disproportionately deeper cuts for UL than some other Louisiana campuses. And four of our academic colleges were at risk for losing accreditation. And if those cuts had stayed in place, those colleges would have been gone. UL students took action. Student government leaders called for a protest rally in Earl K. Long Gym. The statute of limitations has now expired, so I can think I can confess <laughs> that the UL dean of men at the time, who happened to be my husband, Raymond Blanco, was deeply involved, and so was I. Students on the poster-making brigade met in my small vet village apartment. We drafted messages that demanded cuts be rescinded, but some got more personal and said things such as, go back to North Louisiana, McKithen. In the hour before the scheduled rally, student leaders blanketed the campus, and they went from classroom to classroom, getting students telling them, leave this classroom and get to the gym. Their pleas were effective. Earl K. Long Gymnasium was packed with an estimated 6,000 students. As Raymond likes to describe the scene, those students were hanging off the rafters, and that's what it felt like, because I was there. Raymond invited Senator Mouton and State Representative Luc LeBlanc to witness the event, but suggested they listen and not speak. They blended into the crowd and they watched in awe at the focused energy of the university student body challenging the governor. Looking back, I realized that Raymond and I were probably acting a little recklessly, 
Raymond probably could have gotten fired for challenging a governor, but suffice it to say, he survived and thrived along with UL. That, though, I think was a wake-up call for our senator, he was, who was also McKithen's floor leader. He was able to temporarily spare the university from a part of those particular cuts, but he did a lot more than that. That rally changed his relationship to this university from, from, um, from someone who didn't have a close relationship to an avid, avid champion. UL's administration educated him over time on the treachery of funding based on legislative politics, and Sonny Mouton, the problem solver, went for a permanent cure. You see, in 1973, he became a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, and he <coughs> saw an opportunity to correct this serious problem. He was instrumental in drafting language which created the Board of Regents and charged it with implementing a higher education formula funding plan that did not exist in Louisiana before. So clear objective funding criteria based on performance and measurable need was expected. The board would recommend funding to the legislature for every Louisiana college. That constitutional provision removed college presidents from the time-honored process of lobbying the legislature for amendments to the appropriations bill for their particular projects. Not all colleges liked the idea of the Board of Regents having control. Some saw it as a threat to their own financial posture because they, they were very successful. So um, it took a few years, I must say, for that process to be fully implemented. But it is now, and the rest is history. UL Lafayette was freed by objective criteria to begin its march to impressive growth and national respect. And its freedom to grow with a fairer funding model can be directly attributed to Senator Edgar Mouton. Senator Mouton was called back onto the campus for a variety of reasons. Also, in 1970, in that same period, college campuses were erupting with students protesting the Vietnam War. Four Kent State students were killed by authorities trying to control demonstrations. That tragedy, of course, caused even more unrest on college campuses across the nation, and UL was no exception. Students on this campus, just like those across the country, wanted to lower the US flag to half-mast in memory of the four dead Kent State protesters. Governor John McKithen had issued an order that forbade lowering of flags on all state properties. Mayor Kenny Bowen was determined, as were authorities all across Louisiana, to protect the flag from the protesting students. The mayor sent well-armed city police to stand around the flagpole, preventing students from accessing it. Raymond called Senator Mouton to come to campus, hoping he could maybe temper the mayor before things got too dangerous. The atmosphere was growing tenser by the moment when students marched into Martin Hall to the president's office demanding relief. Assessing the situation, Sonny announced he would call Governor McKithen personally to ask him for guidance. Standing in the ante room of President Clyde Rougeau's office where the students could hear his entire conversation, Sonny dialed the phone, yes, we didn't have touch tones or buttons on our phones, <laughs> and he asked to speak to Governor McKithen. He proceeded to have an animated conversation with him. He explained the situation. He listened carefully while he was responding. Yes, Governor. Oh, no, 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 that's fine. Okay, Governor. Well, thank you, Governor. I'm sure the students will be most grateful to you. Goodbye. He turned to the student delegation and he said, Governor McKithen says you can lower the flag to half mass, but only for 20 minutes. Well, the students cheered, and the dean and the senator went down with them to deliver the message dismissing the city police. The flag was lowered to half mass, and the satisfied students dispersed, going about their business. Well, Raymond was totally impressed by Sonny's persuasive powers, and he said, Sonny, what in the heck did you say to Governor McKithen to get him to yield? And Sonny put that great big grin on his face, and he said, Oh, I didn't talk to McKithen. I never had anybody on the phone. <laughs> Peace had been restored, and no one was injured on the UL campus that day. <laughs> that
That is a true story with many witnesses, ladies and gentlemen. So before he ever set foot in the state capitol, Sonny made a clear decision he was not going to go to Baton Rouge to be an obstructionist or a do-nothing legislator. He wanted to be in the game all the way for the good or the bad of it. Effective legislators like Sonny Mouton have a lot of courage and they understand measurable success <laughs> depends on good relationships with the seated governor. Speaking from my personal experience, I can say assuredly all governors need leaders willing to promote ad administration agendas. That means they have to have the courage to cast tough votes at times. So when Sonny was ever chastised for politi politically hot votes, he was heard more than once saying, look, I didn't get elected just to be re-elected. Well, that would have been boring for Sonny Mouton, and he would have accomplished very little. I want you to know that in government, everything is negotiable, and there's always a far greater demand for the goodies than actual dollars could possibly cover. The final arbiter of which projects will go forward and which will be postponed and sometimes indefinitely ultimately rests with the governor. It's so it's unrealistic <laughs> to think that legislators who enjoy criticizing or voting against the serving governor's agenda will actually get projects in their districts, no matter how badly those projects might be needed. So friendship and support for a governor ultimately goes a long way. Sonny Mouton cast difficult votes so he could walk into those governor's offices and expect reciprocity on projects for his senatorial district, but he also asked for others. What others could only imagine for their communities became investment realities for Lafayette. Again, the legislature is no place for the faint of heart. Unless you're directly involved or witnessing the legislative process, it's hard for citizens to fully understand the intense pressure that confronts part-time legislators. Threats from special interests are common. It could be the threat of big money against lawmakers in the next election, which is the most common. They might get a call from their employer inquiring about how they're going to vote. And that can be a not so subtle threat of, you know, maybe your job's at stake. Less commonly, but still very real, are times when legislators actually fear for their personal safety. Over the years, various polarizing issues have taken center stage. In 1976, um, uh, that year was defined by the fierce debate over right to work. It caused legislators like Sonny Mouton to actually fear for their personal safety. See, that year, violence between two competing labor groups in Lake Charles resulted in the death of a worker. This negatively affected public opinion regarding unions and set the stage for business success to eliminate um, union shop in the legislature, in the legislative process. But, and Sonny was torn about how to vote on this controversial issue. And that was in, evident in an impassioned speech that he, that he actually wrote and preserved, which I have the pleasure of reading way too long to give you. But he, um, it, it gave you the insights on how he looked at this thing. You see, for the first time, it, it seems to me by reading his speech and trying to remember and understand what was going on at that period, uh, Louisiana had not seen too many issue-driven campaigns. We had seen political campaigns, but not issue-driven in isolation. So Sonny described how tremendous amounts of money had been spent to brainwash the entire state, adding he had received more mail on this issue than any single <coughs> issue he had ever faced. <clears throat> he mentioned nasty letters, threats, and recall petitions. Because the intense media campaign caused a strong public reaction, Sonny was actually struggling with the loss of his ability to self-determine. See, he and other members of the Senate really enjoyed being able to make an analysis of any particular bill's Pro, the pros and cons of any particular issue on any, anything. So at this juncture, he was getting public pressure, and probably in both ways, and, and it, it just jarred him, because he prided himself in the fact that he could make decisions on his own without assist, assistance of this kind. 
So um, he, he voted yes on the right to work legislation that still stands to today, even though he thought that the citizens might have been misled by exaggerated claims in those ads. Because of that murder in Lake Charles, though, there was this other dimension. Um, those who voted with business actively feared that some angry union member might seek revenge after, after they lost those highly charged debates. The Moutons believed that they were being followed after that bill passed. Patsy Mouton, who drove Sonny back and forth every day to Baton Rouge, by the way, um, she remembers the extra security details assigned to her husband and to other members who had voted with business. They were really scared. Their daughter, Cheryl um, Mouton Trumps, remembers being kept home from school with her sisters for a few days because her parents feared for the safety of their children. It was an anxious and a very unnerving time for the family, but tensions gradually subsided, no harm came to them, and right to work remains the law in Louisiana today. That's just a little example, though, of something that seems so clinical, right to work, but it was very emotional. On a lighter note, Patsy loves to tell a particular story about how Sonny handled what might have been an international incident. <laughs> the Moutons were invited to the Beaujolais region of France, where Sonny and other members of the State Senate were inducted into the honorary Lord de Compagnon de Beaujolais. Senate President Samuel Nunez and Senator Alan Barres and other senators were being honored on this goodwill mission. During the event, a young Frenchman and Patsy swears he was about seven feet tall, <laughs> began encouraging her to down shots of wine with him. Well, Patsy is a wine sipper, not a wine slugger, and she was growing extremely uncomfortable with the attention this young man was giving her. So she signaled a Senate colleague to alert Sonny to the situation. The Frenchman looked at the size of the diminutive man aggressively walking there. Now remember, he's here and Sonny's here. And he laughingly asked, Patsy, is that your husband? And Sonny walked up, uh, Sonny walked up confidently though. He was a man in charge. He, he knew he was the subject of derision, but with all the dignity that he could command, Sonny climbed onto the seat of a nearby chair to stand face to face with this Frenchman who was flirting with his wife. <laughs> now that chair gave Sonny extra height, but he still had to look up to see the Frenchman's face. <laughs> he boldly announced, look, fella, if you want a drink, you can drink with me, not my wife. <laughs> the Frenchman could have just knocked him over just like that. But before he could react, Sonny, not intimidated whatsoever, added, and he's standing on the chair, remember? And by the way, he said, in Louisiana, where I come from, we take the measure of a man from his eyebrows up and from his waist down. And then he added, and not much in between counts. <laughs> <laughs> so the young, the young Frenchman's girlfriend was laughing as she was interpreting for him what Sonny, what Sonny had just said. And when, the, when it hit the guy, he grabbed Sonny around and gave him a great big bear hug. So he was intrigued by Sonny's sheer audacity. And this giant-sized Frenchman from France abandoned his futile pursuit of Patsy and accepted the offer to have a few drinks with the bold, pint-sized Frenchman from Louisiana. So therefore, international incident averted. When the Louisiana delegation gathered the next morning over breakfast, Senator Nunez led the group in a surprise toast to Sonny. The, se the Senate president told them that on the previous evening he had forgotten um, a bottle of Beaujolais wine that he had been given, so he went back to the banquet hall to retrieve his gift, and there he spotted that seven-foot drink totally passed out, sprawled across the table. So the breakfast crowd jumped up altogether and cheered and gave Sonny a standing ovation for having <laughs> for drinking the Frenchman under the table, <laughs> or maybe over the table. <laughs> so I think that's just, you know, a wonderful story. Judge DeQueer, again, described Sonny as fast on his feet and quick-witted. 
You know, his reputation grew far and wide, and it led to a special recognition of his vast talents. Grigri, a Baton Rouge newspaper, began surveys of state government staff members, lobbyists, aides, capital reporters, and legislators themselves to determine who the body politic considered the best and worst legislators. For three years in a row, from 1975, six, 76, and 77, Sonny Mouton was declared the best, most effective legislator of both houses. Compliments abounded, and I didn't have enough time in this speech to give you all, but I'm gonna give you a few. The diminutive Cajun senator is probably the most effective member of either house. He could pass a bill outlawing motherhood. <laughs> his most valuable asset is his sense of humor, rare and refreshing. And then another, Mouton is perhaps the best debater in the history of the Senate, combining wit, logic, and eloquence into a dozen or more speeches a day. That's a lot of speeches, folks. Also, he uses power judiciously. These and more, more extraordinary compliments were earned and deserved. They gave Sonny the confidence to believe that if he were governor, that he could make our state a better place in many ways. Term limits prevented Edwin Edwards from seeking a third consecutive term, creating an open seat. So a number of highly qualified candidates were attracted to that governor's race. Lieutenant Governor Jimmy Fitzmaurice, Secretary of State Paul Hardy, former Senator and Public Service Commissioner Lewis Lambert, Congressman Dave Treen, Speaker of the House Bubba Henry, and Speaker Pro Tem, Edgar G. Mouton, Jr., all lined up to run for governor. That's a pretty power-packed uh, group of candidates. Sonny Mouton was highly qualified for the governor's job. Everybody across Louisiana agreed to that. Nobody doubted it. However, statewide races are very difficult, and this was Sonny's first time, but his platform was very solid. So 39 years ago, in 1979, to show his honesty and his independence, Sonny Mouton released three years of his income tax return, and was, he was the only candidate to do so. Now, you know what we've been hearing over the last couple of years. He supported civil rights, and he spoke, he proudly spoke against eliminating literacy tests for voters that were targeted against African Americans. He was also very proud, and it re was reflected in his campaign literature, of killing the bill that called for labeling blood by race, blood that was collected at blood banks. He proposed consolidating all state agencies dealing with pollution into one office. He, he, that, would have had, that would have effectively created a version of the Department of Environmental Quality, which, by the way, did not happen for another eight to 10 years. So Sonny was pretty much ahead of the curve. He supported construction of the Superdome when it was highly controversial, for which he in turn got Governor McKithen's support for money to build the UL Athletic Complex. Sonny was the consummate jokester, and his campaign brochure opened with this announcement. If all you want for governor is one of the pretty faces, Edgar Mouton is definitely not your man. <laughs> but contrary to that demurring statement on the day that they announced, his bid for governor, a picture of Sonny and Patsy appeared, showing a beautiful, radiant young couple glowing with hopeful promise. Sonny maintained his humor throughout the race. His campaign called attention to his height, his looks, and his brain power. Figaro newspaper in New Orleans headlined his themes. It said, the little man who could. Mouton continues to kid about his height and his looks. He often says he is the shortest, the ugliest, and the smartest candidate in the race. <laughs> now that's classic Sonny Mouton, that self-deprecating humor. Sonny's first meeting with David Garth, was one of the best, who was one of the best political consultants at the time, gave him a whole new story to laugh about, and he would tell this story every chance he got. J.Y. Foreman, Raymond Blanco, and Sonny Mouton traveled to New York to meet the famous David Garth. While Raymond carried extra weight, J.Y. Foreman was badly crippled and he walked with a, a cane, and Sonny was a slight, very short man. As the three walked into Garth's office, the ad man quipped, 
This looks like a circus, not a campaign. You got a fat man, a cripple, and a midget. <laughs> Every time Sonny told that story, I can just see him. He just rocked with laughter. That was a typical Mutonk whip, and that's probably why he hired Garth to do his campaign. Randy Haney, who helped Sonny do it, was his driver and his coordinator, his schedule coordinator, also lived by some Garth tips. At campaign events, never let the candidate stand alone even briefly. Go to him earnestly and brief him on campaign activities. If there's nothing new to brief him on, look real serious and brief him anyway. <laughs> and he did that. Car phones in black bags were new on the market. We call them car phones, they were cell phones, but they were car phones. Um, but the reception was spotty. You never knew if you were gonna get reception. Garth advised Sonny to use that phone and look busy whenever he was around the other candidates, when they went to forums. He said, and even if that phone doesn't work, fake it. Well, Sonny knew that, <laughs> how to do that. Sonny was a great actor. Randy remembers he'd get on that phone pretending to be in the most serious conversations and it was driving his opponents crazy because they couldn't get reception and couldn't figure out how he got reception. <laughs> he challenged his five major opponents to 30 minute one-on-one -on -one television debates and said his campaign was gonna pay for it. No one took him up on that offer. Not to be deterred, he went ahead and he bought 30 minute blocks of time across the state. He went across the state and he began a series of television debates with empty chairs bearing his opponent's names. <laughs> his performance was flawless, fascinating, and very serious. He wanted to talk serious government business. And, you know, I'm sure he had a few little jokes, but he was encouraging people what he, the other people were running typical campaign ads, and he was saying that that was a bunch of bull. So he was encouraging people not to listen to the bull that was coming out of the other campaigns. He made an ad with a live bull, I think at Channel 3, and that was the most talked about ad in the 1979 com campaign. And when I'm done, you're going to be able to watch it on this screen. Um, sadly, none of, of uh, Sonny's tactics worked. See, the one thing that Sonny was not able to overcome was splitting Acadiana with Paul Hardy from St. Martin Parish. They both had big loyal followings who were friends and would have supported the other candidate had only one been running. When you added up their votes, the Acadiana candidate probably would have taken first place and been the de facto governor because at that time Louisiana was Democratic and Dave Treen came in sec would have come in second, and I think the candidate from Acadiana would have won the governor's race. But neither made the runoff, and they were both keenly disappointed. Dave Treen uh, led the field, and Louis Lambert came in second. Then the most unexpected thing happened. All four Democrats announced their support for Treen, the Republican, the state Democratic Party was furious and censured some of them because he, they bypassed Lewis Lambert, who was the Democrat, in the runoff. Not many people realize that opponents in campaigns can actually become friends, and I have la made lasting friendships from many of my opponents. So it absolutely matters whether one is courteous, friendly, or dismissive with opponents. Former Speaker of the House, Bubba Henry, said, when I asked him about Dave Treen, he said, well, Treen was extremely thoughtful and kind to everyone, and he was so easy to like. When asked, all the parties claimed that there were no prior deals cut with Treen before they offered their support. And that was accepted as true because Dave Treen was a scrupulously honest man. Plus, after all was said and done, who could argue against such a talented group of men placed in important positions? You see, Treen took all four of those men and put them in his cabinet. He, he created a team of rivals as 
in the, uh, in the mold of Abraham Lincoln. Edgar Mouton was named executive counsel to the governor. Paul Hardy was secretary of transportation. Bubba Henry, commissioner of administration. And Jimmy Fitzmorris became special assistant for industrial development. While he was there, when Sonny Mouton was that executive counsel, everyone gives him credit for the complicated negotiations that had to be undertaken for the very expensive Cajun Dome. The, um, that project was done while Sonny was Dave Treen's top lawyer. He's widely credit, accredited, uh, given credit for the financial agreements between three parties. UL gave the land. $18 million came from the city of Lafayette with some following obligations or benefits. And $42 million came from the state of Louisiana. That was a lot of money back then. And that was a hard project to get. Because I can remember Son Sonny selling it because he said there was local contribution. And he worked at, he did work with our local legislative delegation at the time to make it happen. They were working hard too. But tonight's not their story. Tonight's Sonny's story. The Cajun Dome is such an important asset to Lafayette, it's hard to remember a time when it didn't exist. But Sonny is widely credited for bringing that thing, that building, that project to fruition. Edwin Edwards defeated Dave Dream in that 1983 election. Um, Sonny Mouton ran against Alan Barres. He tried to reclaim his seat. He really wanted to go back to the Senate. Alan Barres had gotten elected when Sonny ran for governor. So Alan won that race, and I know Sonny was disappointed because he loved the Senate experience. Well, after Edwin took office, he recruited Sonny to work for him, again, as a special counsel. And Sonny stayed for about a year or so before he moved on. But I want to tell you something else that is not widely known. While doing this research, I found a book that had an in interview with Sonny in it. And the interview was done several years after he left office. During his 21 years of service, Louisiana had begun the tedious process of dismantling racially segregated public institutions. Jack Bass and Walter DeVries authored a 1995 book entitled The Transformation of Southern Politics. Sonny shared a story about his first meeting with African Americans in Lafayette, Louisiana. And this is what he said. Well, first, let me say what they said. They said, State Senator Edgar Mouton, who speaks with candor common among the Cajun French in Louisiana, described his experience when he made his first race for the state, the state uh, legislature in 1964 from Lafayette Parish. Then they quote Sonny. I was born and raised here, and I have never shaken hands with a black person before I ran for office. We had black servants and black people working for us. But the first time I shook hands was a traumatic thing. Sonny was so honest. And sure enough, he says, the first African American was named Mouton, a black Mouton. But then he says, once you got into it and saw the very difficult times that the blacks have had, how they survived in our society with the burdens that government put on them. It is unbelievable we didn't have a revolution before now. He goes on, I didn't know much about blacks when I got started. I went to a meeting where I was the only white person there and I made a five minute, very general, simple talk and said goodbye. They said, wait, we've got some questions. Well, I appoint blacks to boards and so forth. And one man said, I have a question that I can't answer. If you can answer it, I'll vote for you. The book tells Sonny's story about meeting that black man who asked how he could tell his seven-year-old son that he could never have his dream job as a line man because the electric company did not hire blacks for those jobs. Sonny says his eyes were opened when he first realized that black parents had the very same aspirations for their children 
similar to his own hopes and desires for his children, but theirs were not attainable so often. So he says, when you put yourself into a one-on-one -on -one human relationship, then you can begin to understand. In 1975, Louisiana had elected eight blacks to the state House of Representatives and only one to the state Senate. That one was uh, Senator Sidney Bartholomew from New Orleans, who later became that city's second black mayor. Sidney and Sonny were proud to call each other friend. They traveled together, they laughed together, and they helped each other all the time. Sidney Bartholomew appeared in one of Sonny's TV ads when, he ran for, when Sonny ran for governor, as only one good friend would do for another. Sonny went on to, became, to become a lobbyist for Pfizer Corporation, a large pharmaceutical company, thanks to Ken Ardwin, who pulled him into that position with him. And he was there doing what he loved to do, bending an ear, teasing someone, selling an idea, asking for a vote. He was on the Jerry Lewis telethon every Labor Day, challenging his friends to donate to muscular dystrophy, and he was on the national board. Years after he left office, asked to describe the role politics played in his life, Sonny told the Lafayette Advertiser, I can't say it's a vocation. I can't say it's an avocation. I think it's more of a frenzied hobby. <laughs> Sonny's advice to those who followed him, the Capitol is a whole different world. You can't lie inside that building. You have to have integrity. You can't be overpowering and succeed. It's such an easy thing to be nice. But most importantly, you can never be too busy for people. After losing the governor's race, Sonny received a very sharp poem by Domingo Ortega from Edmond Reggie that he always treasured. It says simply, bullfight critics ranked in rows crowd the enormous plaza full, but only one is there who knows and he's the man who fights the bull. Sonny was always trying to fight the bull. Lafayette's founder, Alexander Mouton, would be proud of his descendant. It has been my honor this evening, ladies and gentlemen, to try to capture the spirit of Sonny Mouton, one of Lafayette, Louisiana's most interesting citizens. <clears throat> he represented our community with courage, humor, integrity, and keen intellect. I thank the Mouton family, Patsy, you, and your daughters, and all of your children, and your, I mean your grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I thank you for the sacrifices that you made while he served. It is a family sacrifice. And I want to say a special thanks to the Rodrigue family for dedicating resources for this George Rodrigue Foundation speaker series. Were it not for them, we might not be here tonight. To Edgar, Louis, Joseph, Gonzac, Mouton Jr., I offer a special thank you for your grand contributions to our community. We miss you, Sonny. Thank you. Thank you. to improve teacher training, increase teacher pay, and help students get a better education. He's fought for better health care and special aid to the blind, the deaf, and the handicapped. Now he's running for governor, and he set a standard of honesty as the first candidate to release his tax returns. This man is Edgar Mouton. When you see how much he's done in the legislature, you will know how much more he can do as governor. Now that the race for governor has begun, every candidate 
have said, so you will make education a top priority. But it's been my top priority for many years. I fought for better formula for higher education. I fought for special aid to the black colleges and universities. Fought for better teacher training, better teacher pay. My experience has helped me to understand the problem of education and prepared me to lead the fight to solve those problems as governor. Elect Edgar Muto. He's proved how much he can do. It's easy to speak about integrity in government, more difficult to accomplish it. That's why when I announced for governor, I filed publicly my income tax returns so all would know what I earned and how I earned it. And I believe all those who would seek the governorship should do exactly the same thing. The people of Louisiana deserve a high standard of openness from anyone and everyone who would be governor. Elect Edgar Mouton, governor. Five years ago, Last Year Charity Hospital was about to lose its accreditation. That would have meant a serious loss of health care for thousands of needy people. I worked to stop that from happening. I helped write legislation to build this new hospital and ensure effective and modern health care for the future. If we can provide responsible financing for an efficient charity hospital here, we can do it all across this state. And when I'm governor, we will. Elect Edgar Muto. Water is one of Louisiana's greatest resources, but we have to keep it clean. When this river was threatened by pollution, I passed legislation which provides pumping stations to purify the water. Now the jobs dependent on this river will be protected, and the people here will be able to use the river for recreation. As governor, I'll continue to fight to protect our environment. If we don't do that now, we'll jeopardize Louisiana's future. Elect Edgar Mouton. He's proved how much he can do. Leadership is the difference. I'm here in Geneva to make a point. Louisiana first. I'm the only candidate who is tough on crime. I've got good news for the good teachers and bad news for the bad teachers. My campaign is not like theirs. I'm nobody's man, but yours. <laughs> Tired of the same old bull? Vote for Edgar Mouton. and lead full lives. Throughout my public career, I've worked to help these people help themselves. I was co-sponsored the bill which provided this new facility for our state school for the deaf. And I made sure special state revenues were set aside to help the blind. We can't eliminate human need, but we can reduce human neglect. As governor, that's what I work to do. Before I went to the state legislature, I served on the board of trustees of this mental health center. I learned what mental health problems can do to people's lives. When elected, I worked to make certain government did something. I worked with others to move the center to this new and larger facility. I helped obtain state and federal matching funds for the renovations. I believe government can help solve people's problems. That's why I went to the legislature 15 years ago. And that's why I'm running for governor today. Sonny Mouton really is a hard worker. He's a fighter. He's not wishy-washy at all. He states his position on every question without a hesitation. Whenever you need him, he is what we all dream of as a friend. God gave me a reasonably good brain. My people gave me 15 years of experience. The people of Louisiana need a governor like Edgar Mouton, and you can make it happen. Edgar Mouton thinks you've been paying too much at the gas pump for too long, and he's the only candidate for governor with a plan to stop it. As we end the price control on oil, we we'll need many millions of dollars for Louisiana, and that's why I propose to suspend the gasoline tax. It will mean many dollars in your pocket. The state can afford it, and you deserve it. The people of Louisiana need a governor like Edgar Mouton, and you can make it happen. What do you do with potholes? Try to go around them? Drive through them very slowly. Use them as sandboxes? How about potting plants in them? The only answer, get rid of them. With deregulation, and more revenues, the 
state can afford to help you and your students. You deserve it. You can afford it. I'll deliver it. The people of Louisiana need a governor like Edgar Mouton, and you can make it happen. special note of thanks to Kason Acock, who helped Jared Osama. Uh, he is one of Sonny's great grandchildren. 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 Okay. Who um, who helped Jared Osama? We had this old footage. I gave it to Jared, and we brought. He had to send it to New Orleans to be transferred to disc, so we could all see these things. But um, special thanks, Kason. Appreciate it. And thank you, everyone. You're a wonderful audience. Thank you. The preceding program was made possible in part with production assistance provided by AOC Community Media.